that's that's pretty impressive. So, welcome to Drivewire Radio. Um, this is where this is where people come to to learn uh, a little bit more about the artist's uh, background in terms of like the business side of things, because mm-hmm. like. Well, I'll give the story is when I, I, I went to a school called Metalworks here in uh, Mississauga, really awesome school, loved it. it, was great. I didn't graduate, but when we were getting close to the graduation area, I would ask people like, oh, what are you doing after school? Like really excited. And honestly, um, Andre, there was not good answers, not good answers. So, right. So what okay. happened was like something clicked in my head where I'm like, wait, these are like the most talented guitarists and bassists and drummers kind of let's call it in the gta or you know among that group for sure and they're gonna go and work at a place where they don't really want to work for money that they're not really happy with and then they're gonna you know come home and be too tired after an eight-hour shift to really want to create anything and then like it just i can see the the music being on the back burner and then people having you know not being able to create something with it right and i would love I, i would love to interview people like yourself, who have been staying in the industry and figuring out ways through like one thing that I've seen you do is collaboration and the amount of like a huge number of labels and artists that you've been working with. Like if with your permission, I'd love to dig into that side of what you do as well as the talent and the art and the creativity and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can dig into anything. The only thing I mentioned to Francesco was like, I do a lot of these interviews and stuff like that. And we end up talking about my history and, and on and on. Cause I do have a pretty long history and I don't want to like, I'd rather have a conversation on how to help people. Cause then like, by the time we're done, it's like 20 minutes and we've just been talking about my past and like, yeah, it's really interesting and everything, but like, I really want to focus. I'm like, okay. Cause I go back and I listen to them. And I'm like, Oh, it's just like one big story with a few like points in there <laughs> where it's like, you know, it's like, if anybody is like listening to this, they're like, okay, cool. What am I getting out of this? Like, you know, cause the industry has changed, but I would love to talk about like current events or like just get into stuff that might be a little bit more interesting than just my past because my past is interesting, but like, Holy shit! I've told I've told it a million times, and it's just I think people might be getting bored of it or something. <laughs> so. I, I am I'm really grateful to hear you say that um, because so I have I do have a few questions that come from what I've read about you, but I would love to keep the show on something helpful as well. Uh, I yeah. love that. So just so people do know who I'm actually speaking to, though, I want to recap it. This is this is Andre Caden Black. You are a songwriter, producer, like like almost every single thing I imagine in the industry. Like you you do have a, a really long, let's call it Rolodex or just a huge, huge listing of who you've worked with. I am going to name some. Walk Off the Earth, Our Lady Peace, Our Lady Peace, Alicia Keys, One Republic, Jason Mraz, Fifi Dobson. I told my uh, my fiance Fifi and she, she's her face <laughs> it up she's like oh, Fifi, really <laughs> <laughs> so that's really that's, that's really awesome. cool man yeah absolutely the labels just as impressive same like a, almost the same number of labels sony atv warner emi atlantic records curve music 21 entertainment like holy crap man like yeah. cmw north north by northeast the shot uh toronto indie week like dude i think something that's really useful and also touches on your past is like how do you develop that kind of a relationship on that level with the, with that quality of person? And then how do you keep it long-term? Well, you know, I think this comes down to a little bit of luck uh, as well, because I did start in the industry at an extremely young age. Um, and I started at a very high level at a, at a young age. So I was able to, you know, I, I signed my first major management deal with Christmas management when I was, um, when I was like 17 and that's like 1997. So it's like a long time ago. So I was very, very fortunate to like um, make the right relationships and connections through my early experiences, which um, launched me to keep working hard. So half of it is luck and the other half is hard work and dedication and passion. Um, You know, it it was like growing up, uh, I always had the philosophy of like, there is no plan B, you know? So it's just like plan A, I can't just picture myself doing anything else other than music. And if it doesn't work out here, I'm moving, you know, somewhere across the, 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 the globe. Anywhere. towards off a beach or something, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> just escape, you know, escape. So, but no, I really wanted to do this. It was a huge goal of mine. So. 
it, and and that goal being like uh, music full time. Yeah, just getting paid to to be creative and 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 do what I love. I remember, you know, as a kid working these part time jobs, and I remember promising myself like I'm not working another job that I that I dislike. So, you know, it was a promise to myself that I would move forward and and try and and just enjoy my my work, my work life, where a lot of people don't. Yeah. And that's so you just kind of iterated what this is all about, because because I see like I think there's a huge amount of art that doesn't get put out because someone's tired of making fucking Lockheados or whatever at the end of the part of my language. But like, you know, they're tired. They don't want to keep like wherever you work. If you're not happy doing it, it doesn't matter even how much you get paid. It's like if you feel in your heart that there's songs that need to come out and you're suppressing them, that's going to wear on you. And I want to help artists find ways to make it out. So so here we go. You're you're 17. It's 1997. You're like, you know what? Like, I'm making a name for myself. I'm not going to work another job presumably at that time you were already talented with with music or were you just starting um i mean i i mean i think i think i always had talent that i've been building throughout my career but i think at that point joining the specific band that i did it really instilled what is the most important thing as an artist and that is work ethic through practice Mm. and that is when i really learned that um in order to become great at anything you need to put the time into practice. And I think that is what turned me into um, the person I am today. Can you elaborate work ethic through practice? So you were in this band at 17 and they were just like practicing 97 hours a week and you, and that really accelerated you. Is that what you're saying or? Yeah. I mean, like it was, it was an opportunity that I saw because I was, I was a younger, uh, you know, I was, I was a younger artist joining this band and the band, um, the majority of them were older and they were more experienced. So for me, it was like, shit, I have to, you know, I have to kind of compete with these guys. So it's like, they learn these four songs and all of a sudden it's like, now we're playing to a click track or like a metronome, you know, the drummer's playing. So it's now it's like, not only do I have to learn the songs, but now I have to learn specific strumming patterns that I never really thought That's you had right. to learn and, and doing it all to a perfect timing. It's just everything just kind of you just a lot of a lot of work to do to be perfect in the industry. And I never knew that growing up. Wow. So um, would you say that there's ever a point where someone, you know, can lean off the practicing and focus on other things? Or for you, is that key center and key your whole entire career? I mean, at the end of the day, there is a point where you can, when you get good enough at something, you can kind of take the foot off the pedal a little bit. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, in order to get at that point to become a professional and to be able to, you know, um, perform something the way it should be at a much faster pace, uh, it takes time and dedication. And I think that to get there, it's uh, it's not easy. So, yeah, I can completely agree with you. I, I mean, we did a couple... I've done a, a few gigs where they, my band wants to play, you know, the song exactly to the song and the guitar parts really heavy and really fast, or there's some technical pieces. And like, I, I heard a saying once, it's like, every song is easy to play if you play it slow enough. And that's how, and, and, you know, so I really try to quote unquote practice perfectly and go really slow. And then as I can speed it up, speed it up. And then my hand does it naturally. Like that's the best way that I've been able to describe it to other people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's different, but that is one great way of learning. Absolutely. Yeah. That's killer. So, wow. And that was in 97, you got around these guys and they started accelerating you. And so what did you do? Like there had to have been a time where you wanted to just cave and get the day job. Like what did you actually do to support yourself? Was it just a ton of gigs Carter? And then I got noticed or how did you do that? Like, how did I support myself financially through my hustling as a young artist? Is that what you're asking? I mean, yeah. Like, what my goal here is, like, I can't give people talent. I say that on the show all the time. I cannot give that to you. And you have to have a certain level. You have, like, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Practice, like, oh my gosh, my fingers have bled so many different days. I mean that. But from there, I find there are many people of the few who pick up the guitar fewer get to this level and even fewer know what to do from there. Like, is it just booking yourself as much as possible or now would you 
would you build a social media site? Like, what would you do? How, how can I? Honestly, it really comes down to relationships. Honestly, it really does. Um, relationships equal opportunity. Um, you know, people want to work with other people they like to be around in this industry. And that's the way it works. Um, obviously talent does play a part. You're not going to want to work with anybody that doesn't have talent, but when you get into the upper echelon of certain type of talent, um, you know, there's, you know, friend groups work together and, and I, I'm noticing that in the industry. So if you're really, um, fun to be around or someone that, uh, has a connection with someone else, uh, they're going to give you that opportunity before someone else, um, when it comes to, um, job offers or tours or, you know, a lot of uh, the jobs in our industry is uh, you don't even need to apply for most of them. Most of them is just word of mouth. And I know a guy who would be perfect for this, for this scenario. So. Yeah. We have a saying here. That's uh, really, really succinct. It's uh, don't be a dick <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. so are you saying then it sounded like you said relationships are mo more important than talent. Well, I mean, when you come down to it and you've got five extremely talented people, but one of them has closer relationships with the people who are running the industry than the other, the other four, then that guy's going to probably get the opportunity before the other ones. You know, you do yeah. have to get to a certain talent level in order to compete. And once you're at that level, you need to make sure that now you have the relationships to, to gain the opportunities needed. Wow. That's really well said now. So I get sometimes even on drive wire radio, people who just blast a message and they're like, look, like, look, link and subscribe, listen to this. They haven't asked me a single question. There's no pre-conversation. There's nothing. Just here's a link. Like I'm guessing you would probably build a relationship in a different way than that. Like how would you try and do it if you were, if you're starting now? Okay. Well, I mean, we are, we are in a weird time right now, but uh, pre-corona, I would say, um, and post, I would say, go to conferences and meet people in person, get their cards. Like what, you know, um, Canadian music week has been such a huge factor of my success throughout the years. I've been involved with that, um, organization for a long time. And, and the amount of people that I meet in that week is just incredible, incredible. Mm. Um, so and it's a personal relationship when you meet someone and you shake their hand and you have a conversation with them and then you touch base with them after it's, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more personal. And I think that is how you kind of break through the mold of trying to uh, establish relationships with other people in the industry. I think that's number one is going to these conferences and meeting people and shaking their hands. That's really well said. That's really well said. Um, the man's last name is is escaping me, but there was a guitarist at at uh, Metalworks who graduated the year before I went there. But I heard of him, and he landed himself into one of the top three uh, country guitarist bands in in Canada. Um, and I, yeah, it was really cool. And I inter, I just like it wasn't even on air. I just went and interviewed him and paid for his lunch and asked him questions. And I was I'm like, dude, how how did you do that? And he said that he spent more money. And Metalworks is an expensive school. He said, I spent more money in gas going to shows for these bands and just wrapping cables and shooting the shit and talking to them. And then one day they invited me to come drink with them. And then they jammed and I played and they heard me play. And then there was a sickness in the band and they needed a backup and they shot me a message. And then all of a sudden I played with the band and f and f like I'm like, that makes so much more sense. Yes. <laughs> Put yourself in a position where you can be hired. You know what I mean? Put yourself in a position where you can make the right connections for people to think, oh, he, he or she would be great at this. You know, let's just use them. On your website, you have a listing called Teams. Yeah. I think it's awesome. So I actually just uh, hosted a band called Kadima with uh, with Tao on it. Yeah. In, in yeah. The, so that was really cool. They did a show, I think it was last week in Brampton here. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I talk about as well on this show is, is the team. And I love that again. So we're so aligned because it's literally right on your, your homepage is you can mm -hmm. check out my team. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how important it is to have different people doing different stuff? Cause I think a lot of artists are trying to do every single thing themselves and that really kills them. Absolutely. I think it's really important to have 
to build a team as an artist. I think that's one of the biggest um, things that artists don't do in regards to becoming successful is you do, you need to build a team. There's strength in numbers. Um, you know, two heads are better than one. You know, there's a lot of sayings. And, and I do think that one person can't handle everything. I mean, you know, if you can find someone that does one specific thing better than you and they believe in your music and they want to make things happen with you, then bring them on. You know what I mean? And I, I think team building is one of the most, you know, one of the most important things as an artist, in my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And and what I what I bring out in terms of that is when when everyone is doing the thing that they feel good at and they want to do. And that thing that they feel good at and want to do is different for everyone. You start to get this place where everyone feels like, quote unquote, they're not even really trying, but stuff is just being done at a high level because everyone's doing the thing that they're good at. So, uh, forgive my complete ignorance. You're more getting contacted to play with bands. Or are you like songwriting with them? Are you what do you yeah, I mean, I've, I I have done all of that, but at this point, I'm more of a, I guess when you break it down, artist development, I guess. So I kind of cover everything. Um, I like what, what, when I, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a producer. And what, what happens is if an artist comes to me, I build a team around that artist. And we, they don't just come in and, and I press record and, and we're done. You know what I mean? I, we come in, we look at their songs, we help them improve them as best as we can so they can actually learn a little bit more about songwriting. We record them um, with their vision in mind. I'm very pro artist since I am, an, I used to be an artist. I know what it's like when you're working with egotistical producers that Change think they everything. know what's best for your art. So, um, you know, I'm very uh, sensitive to the artist's needs, but still, uh, help them and guide them in certain ways. Once the music is done, you know, I'll help them uh, brand. If they need branding, I'll help them make the right connections, whether it's with PR companies or um, playlisters or w whatever they need. Um, and I see to it till the end. And um, usually artists that I work with, I really believe in them and, and uh, I try to push them as far as I can. So without managing them. When you say branding, you're talking about um, you're talking about like so when I think of branding, I think of, yeah, for sure, like a logo, right? Like some but also like one of the things that I was really struck by on your website, which is an awesome website, by the way, is um, on the audio visual tab when I when I was there, each of the videos is like the song in the video is one thing and they're awesome and they're good and the talent is there but like the video brings it to a whole other level like i feel like i literally feel like i'm watching a movie trailer kind of like a very well produced super high level is that part of the branding as well like are you trying to go with a different vibe for each video is it compared to the song is it whatever the artist wants like yeah i think branding is everything so it's anything that um you feel when you look at the artist or hear the artist or read about the artist. I think, um, you know, you look at, uh, someone like Billie Eilish. I mean, like you kind of hear, you listen to her music and you look at her and you're kind of, you kind of get her, you know, it's easy to imitate her. You could easily dress up like her for Halloween. You know what I mean? Like, right. You, you kind of get it. So that's kind of branding in my opinion. It's just like, there's there's a few artists out there that do phenomenal branding. Um, the Command Sisters are great at branding. You know, if you look at their Instagram, everything's very cohesive. It's consistent. Um, you know, and it's easier to find your niches, your niche audience that way as well through branding. Yeah, so. like they they. So the analogy that I use in my head is like a magnet, but the stronger you attract, the more you repel. But like, if you are a stronger magnet, you're going to attract a lot more people. Like if your branding is more clear, then people yeah. will uh, self-select in a lot easier instead of being like, ah, I don't really know what this is. I don't care. And you lose a lot of people. It's that's me and my personality. I want to, I want to opt in. Exactly. Like people will judge you by look, they'll look at your your logo or they'll Thumbnail. just watch your video and they'll already know if they like you or not. Yeah. 
you know? So, yeah. Are you, as a producer, are you thinking as well about like what I like to call goldfish mentality, like this six second attention span, scroll with your thumb, like move fast. Are you creating like content for that lifestyle or are you just trying to create as good as possible and let it fall where it lands? I think a little bit of both, obviously. Yeah. You, you know, I there are so many times where I'm scrolling and, you know, you pass a video and for the first five seconds, it's, hey, guys, I just wanted to come up on here and just <laughs> boom, I'm gone. I'm out. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. But like, holy, put me to sleep. Just get to it. You know what I mean? People don't people. It's much faster. Things are moving much faster nowadays than they were before. So, um, yeah, it's important to make sure the content is um, is well done, but it's also important that the content is getting to the point quickly. <laughs> Did you know you were going to be a musician since you're like four? Yeah. 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 So you you were the kid who was like always humming and singing and uh, tapping on stuff? Always, man. Yeah. Always tapping on stuff. I remember I used to get in trouble in, in class for using my pencil and playing drums on the desk. Like my teachers hated me. So yes. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Cool. That's another theme that I've learned, right? Like uh, I'm really, really what I've been doing for the past two, three years is, is sinking through different people like yourself who like, I just want to say wholeheartedly, congratulations. Like you've reached a certain level that very few people do and i'm trying to find themes and one of them you touched on which is which is the huge amount of practice it takes but i've also found that almost always those same people who practice a ton deliberately they almost always had a huge amount of accidental practice and i'm gonna call your tapping with the pencils like the, <laughs> the ribbit you know like humming and hawing my mom used to make fun of me when i was a kid because i was singing melodies that she's never heard but i'm like now that I'm older, I'm like, that's pretty cool. I've been like writing music my whole life. Didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, totally. hundred percent. Yes. And I mean, I think what it comes down to are two important words. If you want to be successful in any industry, um, let alone probably the most competitive industry in the world right now, which is music. I think it was acting before, but now that we have home studios from a laptop, anyone can make a record. You know, I think, I think the two things that are the most important that you, you need to have, is passion obviously which i brought up earlier and the second would be obsession you almost need to be borderline obsessed with making uh with being successful in whatever that is in your mind um with your music and that is something that i've noticed in many people that i've met that have been extremely uh successful is they're obsessed with their work and their goals and uh and just getting to that next level in their career obsessed that's so. that was a really cool answer man thank you yeah. for saying that and and i completely agree with you now can't so th i don't know if you'll this is might be too far out this you might not have an answer for this one but can you create passion like what if what if like for me when i was in music school i had to i had to leave music school to fall back in love with music to to do music more because I was putting so much pressure on myself that I felt like was passion, but it was this heavy load of pressure of like, oh, do you think you could compete with that guitarist or that guitarist? So I'm going to put that one just kind of, can you create passion? Yeah, I mean, I think it's half you're born with it. Uh, it's a certain um, it's a certain attitude or a certain per uh, personality trait that you're born with. Mm. Number one, like a work ethic sure. uh, trait. And then number two, I think it's it's a little bit of what you were surrounded with as growing up. You know what I mean? Who surrounded you? Who did you? Who were you watching? You know, who were you mentoring? You know, um, I think that plays a huge part. Whether it be your parents or your friends or your, you know people that you looked up to in the industry, I think that all plays a part in uh, in the way that you turn out as someone who wants to make it in the industry. Like I see some people who are kind of afraid, like they haven't given themselves permission to be obsessed. They're worried about what others would judge them. Yeah. Insecurity plays a huge part in the fault and, and uh, artists not making it. Um, and it's hard. It's so hard. I think 
everybody out there is still has insecurities. I mean, I even have insecurities, you know, still, um, you know, but it's really just how you deal with it, you know? And I think, you know, for me, um, you know, spirituality played a huge part in, um, in bringing my higher self to a point where I can, you know, not worry about past issues or future issues or what people are thinking about me because at the end of the day it just comes down to you know what you're thinking in your mind you know and it's really just mental you know in my opinion from what i experienced it comes down to a mental state that you have to be in in order to navigate through this preconditioned system that we're we're in because there's so many things that we're seeing every day on TV and it's just a constant comparison to you and this other person. And it's just, it's absolutely exhausting mentally, you know? And uh, if you can get past that, I think you've got a pretty good shot at, um, you know, getting to the next level. So, so just to make sure I understood that you're saying stop comparing yourself to the standard stop caring about what anyone thinks about you period and only worry about what the message you want to put out to to people and and you know how you want to be perceived as an artist and remember that it's art at the end of the day i think a lot of people forget that you know it's art and the industry has changed quite a bit since when i was young you know what i mean in regards to artists you know the mainstream when i was growing up it was like nirvana like kurt cobain was like you know today's you know whoever bieber or whatever you know what i mean so it's like that's the difference it was way more angsty it was way more like fuck you this is who we are and i don't give a fuck who who what you think whereas now it's just so goddamn competitive that you almost have to you know morph into whatever's hot you know what i mean at the time but um i always tell my artists that doesn't even matter you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's good to go against the grain and be your own person. And, and that's, that's how you, that's how you make it. So you're advising, do not jump on the trends of the time. Don't try and like, don't try and change yourself for the theme of the day. Be true to you and play it as loud and as proud as you can. Yeah. Authenticity will always rise to the top. Yeah. I dig that. I really dig that. And, and, you know, I, I completely, I have a life experience. Like when you play a show and I'm sure you've seen this and I'm sure it's actually happened to you where if you're in the mood where you're maybe like 5% more self-conscious and you work on the notes really well and you nail every note, but you didn't put yourself into the song versus if you go ham, like really hard and you miss a couple notes or make a few loud noises, but you're in the song, you will get a million times more positive reaction to the second scenario than the first one. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. that to I mean, me is authenticity. Absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, when you have something that's in your head or that's bothering you, you know, obviously you're not, your head's not straight, but when you're up there having a good time and, you know, you just let loose um, to a certain extent, you know what I mean? You do have to, <laughs> realize that it, it is a job and you have to make sure that you go up there and people are paying, paying to see you. So you have to make sure that you're performing properly. Um, but you know, letting loose a little bit and just, and just being playful with it. Cause that's how you're going to get better. You know, that's how you're going to get better is, is just, is just letting go and just having fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there, I see, well, I've been, and also see a lot of artists putting too much pressure, too much pressure, trying to force something to happen. And, uh, in my experience, that's one of the best ways to not get it to happen. Yeah. I mean, pr- the pressure is just, it's insane and it's hard to deal with, especially at a certain age. And then you've got the whole, you know, age aspect to being in this industry. A lot of people feel, and present company included, I felt like there was, you know, a clock ticking and it was just like, I need to do something before I'm a certain age or else time will expire and no one's going to want to work with someone who's 35, you know what I mean? Or whatever. So uh, all of that is just absolute bullshit at the end of the day. I mean, you know, 
if Carly Rae Jepsen can do it, I mean, you know, she was older and she marketed to very young girls, you know, and, and, and boys, but, um, you know, she did a great job in regards to, again, going back to branding. So don't let people try to tell you, you know, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen in your career, because, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen in the music industry is just as, is the same as predicting what's going to happen in the stock market industry. It's just, you're not going to do it. It's impossible. And if you think you're going to be able to, you know, you can predict all you want, but you never really know. It's important to kind of expand your, your talents too. You know, even as a, as a producer, I think nowadays it's really important being, you know, kind of one of those Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, You know, every extremely talented co-producer I work with uh, is, of those of that, you know, they play a, a myriad of different instruments and they, you know, they know a little bit of theory and, and they can edit well on, uh, on their DAW and they can mix well, you know, so it's important to be able to do a little bit of everything. Whereas back in the day, it was, you know, everyone had their role. You were a session guitarist and that's all you did. You know, you were a songwriter. That's all you did. Now it's things have changed, you know, it's you kind like of have to flex a little bit. Yeah. It's not like that. I got a flex. For sure you do. So what was the process like switching then between artists to producer now? Were you were you already working on your DAW, which is, by the way, for people listening to us, digital, digital audio workstation. So sure. you were, were you already editing and then you were already playing multiple instruments or did you decide to become a producer and then start picking up those skills from there? No, I, I, it started as a, as a songwriter. Nice. And then wanting to demo these songs. So oh. I got a laptop and I started with GarageBand and I started tracking them. You know what I mean? And then it just went from there. You know, it went from that to getting offers to produce, you know, certain artists and stuff like that. But uh, it was intimidating for me. Like it was it was really intimidating making that jump from perform like session guitar player, songwriter to producer. It was very... Um, you know, it, I was very apprehensive making that that jump just because it, to me, I was really intimidated by that um, that late that label producer. So, more, yeah, more bullshit in the mind. Yeah, again, and that's something I had to get over, and I did get over, and we're here. But uh, you know, it it was tough because you know when you think of producer, you think of these, you think of some of these crazy talented people in the industry that shape bands and help guide and, and mold bands into what they are. And to me, that is huge. I think a producer's role is so important um, in any, any artist's life. Yeah, I, I can, I can agree with that because you know, like Andre Caden black, when he was 17, you needed, you need the people around you, especially if they're genuine and especially if they have your best interests at heart. But once you have that and you have someone who knows the industry and is saying like, Hey, maybe not that path, maybe this path for you and giving you good advice, like, man, that's invaluable. That shaves years off a career. Game changer. Absolutely. Big time valuable. I, I really dig that. So it seems to me that you've been highly creative your whole entire life in terms of musical and tapping, and getting my rhythm down. Then you got around a group of people who helped lift you. Your environment was there that people were pushing you and pushing you. And then you really, it seems, just tried to absolutely make good on every single commitment, like just for every person trying to do what you said you were going to do. And it's led to this foundation where people are like, no, no, just call Andre, like, just call Andre, like, just no big deal. Just call this guy. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like, I just, at the end of the day, I just want to help people. Um, and, and I think I've shifted from somewhere where it's, I need to do this for me, where somewhere down the line, it shifted to, I just want to see other people successful. Right. And, and when I kind of shifted my mindset to a different um, pers perspective, I think that's when things really started to pick up for me um, from a success standpoint, um, financially, and just having opportunities to speak in front of people and do th doing things like this and try to educate young artists. I love educating young artists. I could sit and answer questions for hours. I just, 
for me, it makes me feel good because I was very fortunate to be um, taught by some of the best in the industry. And um, I just want to kind of, you know, bring that baton back and uh, do the same. That's really well said. And the mindset, the mindset that you said changed that shifted from you was, I think I heard it was helping other people rather than helping self. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. What, how did yeah. you make that switch? Cause that's all that is like that uh, for people listening, like this is, he's talking about a paradigm. Like this is a way of life. We're talking. That's actually a big switch. How did that come about? Um, I think it was the feelings that I got seeing the reactions of other successful artists that I had a part in and the feeling that I got in my body made me happy. And, um, that is the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think that is, was the turning point for me. Um, and I still feel that way, you know, so, you should, you should. Yeah. That's awesome. It, it, I can a hundred percent like resonate with that because you know, there are going to be people who listen to this interview and they're going to hear you, not me. Like I'm just connecting dots that I see, but it's the artist, it, It's the, the guest who's bringing out the value. They're going to hear you, but I'm going to get the message. And they're like, yo, I heard this thing and it was from this artist and like, it was super helped me a lot. And I really am grateful to have heard your show. That message when we get those is like, it's like the whole two or three years becomes worth it just to get that feeling, you know, yeah. the recommendation. I'm like, yo, blast it, put it everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> right? like and it makes you want to do it more. It makes you, and it gives you a different reason. Cause maybe you started the, maybe you started the, uh, you know, the podcast for different reasons, you know, and then it just kind of switches once you actually, you know, experience it. And you're like, wow, I found this deep joy and fulfillment through this, process that I never thought I would. And, um, it's inspired me to change my reasonings for, uh, for, uh, doing what I do. You know what? And, and as I listen to you say that not only has I, do I believe that that has happened, but when that switch happens now, what you are is you're within the same vehicle, but you're making different directional decisions. Cause I'm trying to help more others than myself. And that, in itself yeah. starts to like get more people trying to help you back. Cause you've tried to help so many other people. It's very interesting what you're saying. It's very interesting. And, and you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I believe we're all energy. And if you're putting out a certain, uh, a certain feeling out there or a certain energy, people can pick up on that. Like I artists aren't stupid, you know, when, when they sit down with you at a meeting, um, they know whether you're full of shit or not. So it's important to, uh, to really understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, that's really well said, man. That is incredibly well said. Um, I want to give a little bit of like, you know, a little bit back to yourself. Where can people find you and, and why would they come to you? Like what services would you be providing? You know, how do they give you money and what for? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, honestly, uh, I do. I'm on uh, Instagram a lot. Um, so they can always shoot me a DM on there. Uh, you know, my website is online, andrekadenblack.com. Um, but I'm easy, I'm easy to get in touch with. Um, and you know, I'm always kind of looking for artists or bands, um, who are looking to kind of bring their, their music to another level, whether it be sonically, or maybe they want to you know, they need help with promotion or maybe they just need consultation. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, every artist is different. Um, and I try to tailor my services around whatever their needs are. So um, and sometimes people just reach out to me with questions and that's cool, too. Um, you know, I post on my Insta story often with, I think, things that help uh, that could help artists as well. So, um, education. I, I am grateful that there are people like yourself who are passing along this knowledge. Like I, I'm really trying hard to create a hub of that kind of knowledge. And we are going to go back and now that we have so many shows, we can archive them and we're going to create on our website, like 
these are our PR guests and these are our, you know, producer guests and these are our musician and artists. And this is, you know, if you're trying to get into photography or artistry or this is, you know, the best conversations about sync licenses and mechanical licenses. And like, uh, this is the lawyer stuff that you like should probably know in a fun kind of way. Carter makes it as fun as humanly fucking possible, even though it's boring as <laughs> shit. Right. <laughs> But, yeah. but if we could have artists like knowing this stuff, at least huh. having an idea of it so that when they sign the first deal, they're asking intelligent questions. Like that would be really cool for us. And having having people like you so willing to give out this information is is awesome. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to do it. You yeah, know, I, I, I really... have all this information in my mind. I just want to like, you know, I just want to put it out there. There's never been a question in the industry that I haven't been able to answer. So um, I love doing it. That's a bold claim. I'm going to write some questions and get you back on this show. Do it. <laughs> I love the challenge. I love it. <laughs> no, man, it's Hold been up. really, it's been really cool. And, and learning about, I love that you were saying like, it takes the work ethic to practice. It takes the relationships. Like, I'm a big advocate of shaking hands, like shaking hands, like go to attend the conferences, uh, the conferences, specifically Canadian Music Week and others like that's that's really good advice. Like you said, branding was anything you feel from someone's content. And I had never really put it like that. Like I know that DriveWire does have a particular feel. And I know that when we get into writing content, which we're starting and then also like doing individual just Carter on the show, like this is a thought that I had that could help you like that's going to have a certain feeling, but now I'm going to be aware that that's what I'm trying to do is the feeling about it. So I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Like these that's are, awesome. these are cool connections that I'm going to steal from you. <laughs> Good. They're, they're, they're here to steal. Yeah, you know? man. That's how I feel. I tell people all the time, like, I don't want money. I just want credit. Like if, if it works and someone asks you where you got the idea, just say, I got it from driveway. That's all I want. That's I love that, man. You were one of our only guests as well to talk about passion and obsession. You, yeah. I think that, like I heard a saying and I'm pretty sure it's from Grant Cardone. You know who this is? Okay. Grant, Grant Cardone's like a, a very wealthy real estate kind of guy, sales dude, you know, big cocky ego kind of dude. But he says, yep. give yourself permission to be obsessed. Yes. Give yes. yourself permission. Like, like I'm okay looking fucking weird because I'm up and my friends are like, dude, are you going to hang out? I'm like, no, I'm going to go play guitar. Like I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's like, you know, we live in a we live in a time where um, I think a lot of people are judged um, and, you know, cancel culture and all that bullshit. And I think a lot of people are very hesitant on what they say and how they act or how they react or or whatever in fear of not coming off nice. Right. You know what I mean? And I think in order to be obsessed with something, you need to, you kind of need to be, you kind of need to prioritize yourself in a way. Like you mm -hmm. said before, it's like, well, am I going to go out tonight with my friends or am I going to stay in and practice? Well, sorry guys. Like I, I can't, I can't make your party tonight. I'm going to be practicing like I have been the last seven days because That's I have something that I have to be ready for for next week or whatever it is. You can't, but, you can't you know, go somewhere and not piss people off. That's what I mean. It's like tough. you it's have tough. to, you have to roll the dice and take the chance, man. If you don't roll the dice, then you're too lukewarm. No one's going to fucking like you anyways. And it wasn't like that back in the day. It was almost kind of cool to be an asshole back in the day, like in the nineties. You know what I mean? It was like, if you were kind of a dick, like you were, <laughs> it was like, whoa, that guy like totally ignored me. He's like, you know what I mean? Like it was just different. You know what I mean? Now I don't think people have, um, I don't think people have patience for that anymore and, and things have changed and, and it's good. You know, I think things have changed for the better, but we also lost a little bit of that grit, which um, I got put through the ringer of the old school um, mentality of like, you know, you know, borderline scolding, you know what I mean? So hard knocks you know th those days are, are far and few between i think comparatively how so. important do you think those hard knock days were though how important i think they were very important um they broke down my ego uh which is very important i find a lot of artists nowadays uh are they may not act like it but they are a little bit uh, they have a lot of ego um you know, when they probably shouldn't. Uh, but that broke my ego down. And I, I try to do that with artists as, as well. You know, I'm not as 
aggressive as I used to be. I used to be extremely aggressive, but you know, I think there has to be some sort of, you know, some sort of lessons that young artists need, do need to learn, like I did, um, that is a little bit more harsh, hundred percent. How do you teach someone that? Um, like that, you that's you, you don't compliment them as much as they sh- should be. That you know, you just don't mother them, or you know, like don't cater to them too much, and just tell them that there's a standard that we're trying to hit. You know, and and for you to get there, you kind of have to go through the motions and also be be a a good um like a good mentor like a good someone who can who can be shadowed so yeah you kind of just i like that though you make you make the standard really clear yeah because so i i actually really like that a lot and here's why is because it's the same principle in my opinion as like you are the five people who you spend the most time around Mm -hmm. so like I'm not going there directly with it, but if you, if you have a a standard and it's like, yeah, like we always perform at this standard, someone who's new to that standard, isn't going to know if it's high or low, they're just going to know that's the standard. So you could set the bar actually very quite high and just, yeah, like that's, I'm expecting you to play every song perfect. And the pressure is there a little bit, but it's not there so much that if they F it up, they're going to be all, you know, broken over it. You're going to let them, you know, get over exactly. it. Exactly. I mean, like. That's well, that's smart. Yeah. Like I was pushed as a young artist extremely hard to be the best I could be. Um, and maybe it was, there were times where it was a little unhealthy, but at the same time, I think that is what excelled me to be to a point where I could do this for a living. Listen, man, thank you. When uh, when we get this show back uh, into the studio, I would love to, now that I know where you're coming from, ask you a lot more detailed questions about it, maybe for round two. I would love to get you in person. I would love to be a return guest. So anytime you'd like me to be back, you just send me a message and I will be there with bells, bells you on. You got it, man. Thank you. And what we'll do maybe is uh, if you have topics that you're like, hey, I find this is something that I would love to talk about, we'll, we'll dive deep on it and get it out there to just, just really get the information in the hands of artists who are, who are trying, who are starting. Absolutely. Or we can get some questions, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, from artists. Yeah. From artists ahead of time. That'd That's a really, really cool question, man. I'm going to reach out to you with a plan for that. Um, f- maybe like five, six months from now, we'll plan like big, big time and we'll get a ton of questions added in and we'll pick the best ones and we'll, we'll do a, we'll make a whole series out of it, man. You're going to yeah. have your own drive wire masterclass. By then. <laughs> That'd be great. I'm into it. Dude, me too. Me too. Thank you for uh, sitting on the throne the whole time. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. I appreciate it. Another spiritual brother. We're all energy. You and me both. I believe it, man. That's right, man. Nothing, nothing but a light being on its way to more light being right. And that's what it is. That's right, man. Cool. That's right. Exactly. Hey, man. Exactly. Thanks a lot. And congrats on everything you've been through and, and, and gotten to do. Like, I know you intentionally did want not want to go into your past, but I think it's awesome that the past that you've had is the past that you've had and you're, you're yeah. trying to give it back. No, this is a great interview. I think we uh, we there was some great content that we uh, spoke about. So.